What's up you guys? So in this one we're going to talk about non-singular matrices. So let's start by a definition of what a non-singular matrix is. So given a square matrix, that is A, for example, of size N, we say that A is non-singular or also invertible if there exists, so this sign it means there exists a matrix B of same size such that AB is BA is also equal to the identity matrix I. If this is the case, then we say A is non-singular. If you can find such a B that commutes with A and gives I, then A is non-singular. Else, if there is no such matrix, then A is singular or non-invertible. In that case, A will not have the so-called inverse. If you look at B, for a moment, B is playing the role of 1 over A, right? So if we're back in the real number system, if I have a number A and I multiply it by B, which is the same as saying BA, in case I get a 1, then what is B? It is 1 over A, right? Or in other words, it is the inverse of A, right? Well, the same thing here. If you can find an inverse of A, then A is non-singular else it is singular or non-invertible, right? So we will be using the term inverse, right? So B is the inverse of A, if it exists, of course. So for that, let's mention a very important theorem. The theorem says that matrix A can have only one inverse. So how do we prove that? Well, one technique of proving uniqueness of something is assuming there is two of this something, right? And then in the end, you get a contradiction. So let's say we have two inverses, B and C, right? Well, what do we have? If we look at C times AB, what do we get? This is equal to CA first times B. Now, AB is I, right? This guy is I, and this guy is also I. Why? We have, by assumption, AB is I and CA is I. Well, that means we get CI is IB, which also means that C is B. Well, you assume two, two matrices, B and C, that are the inverse of A. You're assuming that they're different, but they turn out to be the same, right? We didn't get a contradiction. No, we got uniqueness, which is good, which is what we need. So this means that if you have an invertible matrix, well, guess what? Its inverse is unique. Now another theorem worth proving is the following. So let's say I've got a matrix B that is such that BA is I. Then AB also has to be I. It means in this case B and A commute. Well, how do we prove that? So first let's assume that BA is I. What does that mean? Let's take a look at AB times AB. Well, let's perform BA first. That is I, right? BA is I. So we get AB. So this line over here gave us that AB, AB is AB, right? Which also means that AB, AB minus AB is zero. We just subtracted AB on both sides. Now let's factor AB. We get AB minus I, right? This is zero. This means that either AB is zero or AB minus I is zero, right? Now let's call this case one, and let's call this case two, right? So in case one, what do we have? If AB is zero, then ABA is also zero, right? But BA is identity by assumption. That's what we have, right? Since this guy is identity, so A has to be zero, right? Because if this guy is identity, then the only thing that could know or zero, this identity is by multiplying it by a zero. So we get that A is zero. Okay, so what's going on? <laughs> but we have that B A is identity, so hold on. How come A is zero, but B A is identity? This cannot be true. You cannot multiply the zero by a matrix that is B and at the same time get identity. You just cannot. So case one doesn't work. It's not from A B equals zero. It has to be case two. So let's argue case two. Let's see what happens when AB minus I is zero. We get that AB is equal to I. Now here there is no contradiction, so 
we got that AB is I starting from BA is I, right? So the proof is done. If B is such that BA is I, which we had here, we did all this logic. We got two cases. Case one is not possible. However, case two is, then we arrived at AB is I, and the proof is done. So this is it, and we can from now on denote B by A to the power minus 1, that is the inverse of A. So from theorem 2, we got that A times A inverse is A inverse times A is the identity, right? And from here, you can actually show that the inverse of the inverse is actually the matrix itself. So the inverse, of course, has a number of other properties that are fundamental in developing results in linear algebra. For example, if we take a look at the following, the inverse A inverse multiplied by AB, this is the same as saying the inverse first multiplying A inverse by A, then B, well A inverse A is identity, so you get this, which is this, that is this, right? And so, what have we proved here? We have proved that AB, the inverse of AB is this matrix. So, AB inverse is actually B inverse A inverse. What does that mean? Why is it important? It means when you're inverting a product of two matrices, you have to exchange the roles of the inversion of each matrix, then multiply. We can actually generalize this result to a product of M non-singular matrices. So, to this extent, assume we have M non-singular matrices denoted by A1 down to AM. Well, if you're interested in A1 times A2 down to AM, the inverse of this matrix, A1, A2 down to AM, well, it is first AM inverse, then AM minus 1 inverse down to A2 inverse, A1 inverse. So we flip the order, then multiply. So the inverse of a product equals the product of the inverses in reverse order, okay? Now, we're not going to show you in this lecture how to compute the inverse. We're going to leave that for future lectures, okay? But keep in mind one thing. It is computationally expensive. So computing an inverse on a computer is not fast. <laughs> it requires a lot of computations. Now, why is the inverse also important? It shows up in a number of applications, such as solving linear systems. We've got the following theorem for linear systems that says if matrix A referred to in linear systems as the coefficient matrix of let's say n equations in n unknowns, if this matrix has an inverse, then Ax equal B has a unique solution x equal A inverse times B. Okay, this is very important. So the proof of this theorem is actually twofold. First part is the uniqueness. So notice that in the theorem we mentioned a unique. So you have to prove uniqueness and then you prove the existence. That is x equal a inverse times b. So how do we prove the uniqueness? Assume we have a x equal b, then multiplying by the inverse on both sides. Why could we multiply by the inverse? Because in the hypothesis we have that if a has an inverse, that means a to the power of minus 1 or the inverse of a exists. And hence we could play around with it, right? So we multiplied by an A inverse on both sides. So let's perform A inverse A first. And we know that A inverse A is the identity matrix I. So we get that X is A inverse B. And this is unique. Now why does it exist? So for that, let's first assume that X is A inverse times B. Then if we plug it in AX, we get A into A inverse times b. Let's perform a times a inverse first. So we get i b, that is b. And hence it exists. So some remarks related to linear systems. So if a x is 0, this system, this particular linear system where b is 0, is said to be homogeneous. Sort of like differential equations, right? Where the right hand side is 0. Now if a is non-singular, that is if a inverse exists, what does that mean? It means the system has only zero as its solution. Why is that? Simply invert, multiply by the inverse on both sides. You get A inverse times AX is A inverse zero. That is zero. Now, 
perform a inverse a first, which is 0. You get ix is 0. That means x is 0. So if a has an inverse, it means that the only solution to the homogeneous linear system is x equal 0. Okay? This is also referred to as the trivial solution. That is trivial <laughs> that if you want to null something out, then you multiply it by zero, right? Now, the other extreme of that is that if the inverse does not exist, so A is singular, then X doesn't have only the trivial solution as a solution. No, it has other solutions that are not the zero vector. We'll see that later on in future lectures. Now, let's lay down an example on the inverse of a matrix with an application to homogeneous systems. So I've got this homogeneous system, x is a vector of size 2, and this 0 is a 2 by 1 vector. Let's try to apply theorem 3, saying that if a has an inverse, then ax equal b has a unique solution, x equal a inverse times b, right? So my a over here is this matrix. Let's try to find its inverse without the inverse formula, which we at the moment don't know, right? So what we can do is find a inverse that we multiply by a to give i, right? So denote a inverse by a 2 by 2 matrix containing elements a, b, c, and d, which we need to find. So let's multiply a by a inverse, but that has to be the identity matrix, right? So 1, 0, 0, 1. Now let's multiply those two. We get a plus 3c and b plus 3d, a plus 2c, and b plus 2d. That should be equal to 1, 0, 0, 1. So we've got 1, 2, 3, 4 equations in 4 unknowns, a, b, c, and d. We could write this as a plus 3c equal to 1, b plus 3d equal to 0, a plus 2c equal to 0, and b plus 2d equal to 1. Now, using any method that you like, elimination, substitution, whatsoever, you can go ahead and verify that A is minus 2, B is 3, C is 1, and D is minus 1. So our A inverse will look like this. So now back to the system we have, AX equals 0. Let's multiply by A inverse on both sides equal to a inverse 0. Now a inverse times a is the identity i times x is equal to a inverse times 0 is 0 and hence we get x equals 0, right? So what do we conclude over here? Since we found the inverse which is unique minus 2, 3, 1 and minus 1 then by theorem 3 since a has an inverse then ax equal b has a unique solution a inverse b which in our case is the trivial solution. Right? Now, a small remark here would be on the inverse of A. Now, of course, when you go to higher dimensions, you're not going to lay down n by n unknowns that are n square unknowns and solve n square equations. No, there's a formula that you can use for that. Now, for a 2 by 2 matrix, that is A, B, C, and D, the inverse, you can verify, it has the following formula. So 1 over AD minus BC. So the denominator is A times D minus B times C. Multiplied by, you swap D with A and you negate B and C. Okay. Now let's see if this works. Let's see if we can get this inverse. So we've got that A is 1, 3, 1, 2. So let's compute A inverse using this formula. So 1 over AD minus BC is 2 minus 3, which is minus 1. Swap D with A, get 2 and 1, and negate B and C, minus 3, minus 1. Now you have a 1 over minus 1, that is a minus 1, so absorb it inside the matrix. So you multiply minus 1 by each of those entries, you get minus 2, 3, 1, and minus 1. So this is A inverse. So our calculations here meet the formula here. And one thing to keep in mind here is the denominator term, AD minus BC. What is this called? It is called, we will see it in future lectures, but it is called the determinant of matrix A. Okay? Usually denoted as det of A. Like the trace, the determinant is also an operator. It takes in a matrix, returns a number. Now, when is the determinant useful? It's useful to check if the matrix is invertible. So it happens that if the determinant of A is 0, 
then A inverse does not exist. If that A is not zero, then A inverse exists. It's worthy to keep this remark in mind. Okay, so that's it for this lecture. We pretty much did a lot of stuff. We talked about non-singular matrices, gave its definition. Another term for non-singular is invertible. That is, if its inverse exists, that means the matrix is non-singular. Now the inverse, we gave some theorems on that, then introduced the notion of an inverse matrix. Indeed, the inverse matrix is of great theoretical importance in linear algebra. Given a square matrix, the inverse matrix abides by the following formula over here. A times A inverse is A inverse times A is the identity matrix I. So when this inverse exists, the inverse is unique according to theorem 1, right? And thus the matrix is termed non-singular. Now not all matrices have an inverse, and such matrices are said to be singular. Now in the case of linear systems, a linear system AX equal B has a unique solution X equal A inverse times B only when A is non-singular. We gave a remark on homogeneous systems, right? And a very important result on homogeneous systems is that X equals zero is the only solution if A is non-singular. We give a particular example on how to compute the inverse of a two by two matrix, either by using the hard way, right? By saying, oh, we have a matrix of unknown entries. We compute those entries using a system of four equations and four unknowns, or we made use of the formula. The inverse of A of the two by two matrix is one over its determinant, which in a two by two matrix is AB minus BC. Then we multiply it by an appropriate matrix. Last but not least, we talked about the determinant of a matrix and showed its usefulness. That is, you can check if a matrix is singular or not, invertible or not, through the determinant. If the determinant is zero, then the inverse does not exist. Otherwise, it does. Thanks for watching. If you found this lecture beneficial, please consider liking the video and subscribing to the channel. If you have any questions whatsoever, please leave a comment down in the comment section below. I'll make sure I'll get to it as soon as possible. Thank you so much and I'll see you in future lectures.